Hey, what's going on guys? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be building a small form factor AMD APU powered mini PC. Now with this build here, we're going to be using a case that I've had my eye on for a little while. I've actually had it in my possession for about a month, but I haven't gotten around to building in it. This is known as the NWIN B1. Now I do have to admit that when I first saw this online, I wasn't a big fan of it. And still looking at pictures online, it really doesn't do it justice. But after getting this in my possession and taking it out of the box, I think it looks like a really nice little case. It's definitely really different from other mini ITX cases on the market, and it does resemble kind of a turret from Portal. And with a price of $85, it does come with a 200 watt power supply, but the main thing I'm concerned about with this unit here is cooling because there's not much ventilation. It does come with a single 80 millimeter fan to exhaust all that heat out, but the maximum clearance on the CPU heat sink is only 60 millimeters. And for this build here, we're actually going to be throwing in 8 cores and 16 threads with the Ryzen 7 4750G. So we got those 8 cores with a base clock of 3.6 GHz and a boost up to 4.4, plus we have the built-in Radeon 8 graphics running at 2100 MHz. RAM is going to be covered by 16GB of Team Force Delta R running at 3600 MHz, but I've been able to overclock this in another system up to 4000 and we'll definitely try it with this because the faster we can get that RAM, the better performance we'll get out of these built-in Radeon graphics. Storage is going to be handled by a 512GB M.2, it's a Z340 by Team Force, and I also have another 500GB 2.5 inch SSD from PNY. For the motherboard, I went with the ROG Strix B550i Gaming, and one of the big reasons I wanted to choose something like this, a B550 versus an old 450, was this actually supports the 4750G right out of the box. I didn't have to update the BIOS or anything like that. And finally, for the cooling solution, I'm going to be going with the ID Cooling IS47K. This is 47 millimeters tall, so we do have plenty of room inside of this case that only supports up to a 60 millimeter heatsink. And I've actually tested the same heatsink in the new ASRock Desk Mini running a 4750G, and it'll definitely keep this CPU cool as long as we have that ventilation. So if all works out, this will be the cooler I'm going to be using. If not, I'll have to resort to something else, but I think we'll be good with this whole setup. So first things first, I wanted to give you a look at this case here. It's actually really interesting the way they've set this up. The whole top comes off. We have that tempered glass on top. I kind of wish they would have offered one with mesh instead of tempered glass, but at the time of making this video, they do not. As you can see inside of here, we have a 200 watt power supply, a pre-installed 80 millimeter fan, and looking at all this wiring inside of here, hopefully I can clean this up really nicely. It does look like a mess right now, but I think once everything's put together and a little bit of zip tie magic is thrown on this thing, we can clean it up really nicely. And the bottom is actually removable and it'll fit two 2.5 inch hard drives or SSDs. So we do have a lot of storage options with this mini ITX case. All right, so let's go ahead and start the build. First thing we're gonna start off with here is the M.2 SSD. There's a spot on the bottom, but I'm going to throw this one on the top just in case I want to add another one later on down the road. I cannot access this once it's all put together, so I'm just going to throw this 512 gigabyte unit here first. Alright, so now that we have the M.2 out of the way, it's time to throw this CPU in. We're using that 4750G. Now these can be obtained on eBay. You can go gray market with it. Uh, that's exactly what I did. Sometimes you can find a good deal on them. Sometimes they're a bit overpriced. So it's really hit or miss with this CPU, but I'm a big fan of this thing. Performance is absolutely amazing for an APU. Now it's time to mount this CPU cooler on here, and uh, it is a bit of a pain because it kind of covers the whole board here. So I'm going to go off camera just to get this on. I do have to do it upside down and backwards to get this mounted correctly. And as you can see, that CPU fan is actually mounted to the bottom of the heatsink itself, and it pulls air up and pushes it through the heatsink instead of pulling air in. I still have full access to my RAM slot, but as you can see, it is covering up that M.2 slot, and that's why I had to put that in before I did anything else. So I'll go ahead and put my RAM in here, and this is the Delta R from Team Force. It is RGB on the top, and I'm not a big fan of RGB, but I did have this laying around, and I think it might look pretty good inside of this case, given that we have that glass top. I think adding a little bit of color to this setup will make it pop a bit. Now it's time for the fun part, fitting all this inside of this super small form factor case. I've already put my IO shield in here. Mainly, what I need to look out for is just pinching any wires and clearance. I have not measured this, but I really think that everything's going to fit in here. 
The main thing I was worried about here was the clearance on the heatsink, but this is a 47 millimeter heatsink, but they claim you can use up to a 60, so I think we'll be good to go with this one. It's definitely looking a bit tight in here, but after all, I mean, this is a mini ITX case and uh, it fit in here. So all I need to do is bolt it down, get all my wires plugged in and clean it up. And yeah, after a little bit of cable management, it came out way better than I thought it would be. I figured we'd have wires all over the place, but with a couple zip ties, I think it looks pretty good. Now, before I start this up for the first time, there's one last thing I need to do here. On the bottom, you can actually remove these feet if you just want to use it in the vertical position. But we need to install that 2.5 inch SSD and they make it really easy. This fits two 2.5 inch mechanical hard drives or SSDs. And from here, I can actually get to the other M.2 slot on the motherboard. So with this setup, you can add a ton of storage. So I've got everything installed, everything's cleaned up. I've placed the top on the unit. It's time to boot this up for the first time. We do have a power button right on the front of this thing, so I'll go ahead and press it. So we got the RGB going on that RAM, and I think it looks pretty good. Now I haven't removed the rear feet because I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to be placing this, but I think it might be in the vertical position like you're seeing now. I think it looks really great like this. Now I need to go ahead and get all my software installed, and we'll get right into some testing. Alright, so here it is. I've installed Windows 10 Pro. I've got a lot of applications that I want to test out and some games. Now one thing that I've noticed is this CPU is actually registering as the 4700G and if I head over to the AMD website, I would no longer see the 4750G. A little weird there, but even on the chip itself, it's stated that this is a 4750G. Either way you look at it, I don't think there's any difference between the two. We still have 8 cores, 16 threads, base clock of 3.6 with a boost up to 4.4. We got 16 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM, and I have overclocked this to 4000 megahertz, and the built-in AMD Radeon 8 graphics. Even in CPU-Z, it's telling me that this is the Ryzen 7 Pro 4700G, and in GPU-Z, it's telling us that the GPU clock will go up to 2100 megahertz, but it's weird because when playing a game and I have Afterburner running, it's stating that the GPU is actually going to 2200 megahertz, and I haven't changed any of the settings in the BIOS except for the RAM speed. So whenever I build one of these machines, a lot of this is really dedicated towards gaming, but using this as an everyday desktop, you'll have no issues whatsoever. We'll just head over to AMD's website. You can see, I mean, it loads up super quick. And on the 4000 series page, you see we have the 4700G here. I don't see the 4750 listed anymore. 4K video playback on something like this is gonna be no issue whatsoever. Just head over to this video here. Make sure we have Stats for Nerds going full screen, and just to show you, we are at 4K. You have a couple drop frames when you first start off, but it's going to play 4K 60 all day long. Whether you're streaming it with your favorite apps, be it Netflix, YouTube, Plex, or you're playing it natively from a hard drive or a NAS. I mean, this has more than enough power to do 4K video playback at 60 FPS. So far, I've been really impressed with the performance here. I did run some benchmarks and I tested out some games. First thing we're going to take a look at are benchmarks. First up, we have Geekbench 5, single core coming in with 1,182, multi 7,947. Taking a look at PC Mark 10, total score of 5,616. And as you can see from the chart here, it's better than 69% of all other systems tested with PC Mark 10. 3D Mark Night Raid, 18,041. Firestrike coming in at 4,398. And finally, Time Spy, coming in with an even 1,700. Now this might not look that impressive on paper when you see other higher scores with dedicated GPUs installed, but keep in mind, these are integrated graphics. We're working off that CPU with the built-in Radeon 8 graphics, and for what it is, I think these scores were pretty decent. But now I really want to put it to the test and run some of my favorite PC games and see how this thing performs. First up, we have Forza Horizon 4, 1080p, low settings, and I got an average of 68 FPS with this one. And this game, even on low, looks really great for an arcade racer.
Next up, we have CSGO 1080p, high settings. By the end of this, I had an average of 121 FPS. Fully playable, it runs great here. And if you want to get a better frame rate out of it, you could drop those settings down, but I think this is running great. Next, we have one of my favorite games, Skyrim. This is actually the special edition version. 1080p, high settings, it'll run at 60 all day. GTA 5, 1080p, normal settings. I think it did a pretty good job here. At the end of this, I had an average of 66 FPS. So if you just wanted to turn V-Sync on and play this at 60, it'll do it just fine. Crisis Remastered. I was actually pretty impressed here. I've tried this on lower end machines and it's just a hard game to run, even at 1080p low. But we did get an average of 32 out of this one. Doom Eternal, 1080p, low with 100% resolution scale. This uses the Vulcan back end. We got an average of 66 FPS out of it. And finally, we have Cyberpunk 2077. Originally, I wanted to do this at 1080p, but it was around 23 to 24 FPS, so I did drop this down to 720p low, and I got an average of 42 FPS out of this, and it's still pretty impressive given the fact that these are integrated graphics running Cyberpunk 2077. Taking a look at total system power consumption from the wall using a kilowatt meter. At idle, it averages around 23 watts. 4K video playback, 31. Gaming, around 79 watts. And the maximum that I could get this to pull from the wall was actually way higher than I thought it would be at 153 watts. Now that's an extreme use case scenario. All eight cores, 16 threads, and the built-in Radeon 8 GPU were totally maxed out, but I really wasn't expecting this system to pull over 130 from the wall. But as you can see in that extreme test, it did 153 watts. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I was really worried about CPU temps, given that we're in this enclosed case, the NWIN B1 with that IS47K CPU cooler. Basically, the only air outlet we have is that 80 millimeter fan that's in the case itself, but it did a really good job. Idle, we averaged 36 degrees Celsius. 4K video playback, it did jump up to 42. Gaming, we averaged 68. And in my extreme test, I was able to make this thermal throttle at 90 degrees Celsius. But again, that's an extreme test. Under everyday normal use or even heavy use with 1080p gaming, you'll never see those kind of temps and you'll be totally fine with this unit. As for noise, it's not bad at all. At idle and 4K video playback, I really can't hear this thing. It does ramp up a bit when you're gaming at 1080p. But overall, I think the noise that this does put out is totally justifiable given that we have such a small form factor PC here. So yeah, I'm really impressed with the performance of this build given that we don't have any dedicated GPU. It's definitely a small form factor unit and I'm really digging this NWIN B1 case. Seeing it in pictures really doesn't do it justice. It's actually a really good look in mini ITX case. I know my regular viewers wanna see how this handles emulation so I do have a full emulation test video coming up. Definitely stay tuned to the channel. I got a great feeling here that we'll even be able to do Wii U and PS3 with this setup just like it sits. But that's going to wrap it up for this video. I really appreciate you watching. If you're interested in putting something like this together, I will leave links in the description. 
When it comes to that 4700G or the 4750G, just keep an eye on eBay. Make sure you pick one up at a decent price because you don't want to overpay and the scalpers are definitely raising the price on these things. But they do show up every once in a while for a reasonable price and if you're looking to build a small form factor PC like this, I'd say this is one of the best CPUs you can use right now. But that's it for this one. If you have any questions or you want to see anything else running on this unit, just let me know in the comments below. And like always, thanks for watching.